Welcome, everyone. Um, this is uh, the seminar of the Minerva Center for the Rule of Law Under Extreme Conditions at the University of Haifa. And we are very pleased and indeed excited to have Peter Beinart with us today here for a special conversation under the title of Debating the Futures for Israel-Palestine. Uh, about um, a month or uh, in late July, uh, we had a conference here um, about the 25th anniversary of the Oslo Agreements organized by Oren Shlomo and Rotem Rosenberg Rubens. During this uh, conversation, we had, I think, one of the most open and indeed disorienting um, discussions of what comes next in this area. It was really um, remarkable to see that uh, the shadow of the then pending annexation threw people into deep existential questions that I think um, are not usually the stuff that we discuss in the center, but nonetheless, um, in incredibly important to address head on. After that conversation, uh, we wanted to continue discussing the same themes in greater depth. And Samer uh, Abderozak Sinjalawi, who is here with us, made the very kind suggestion to reach out to Peter um, in our name and try to organize an event in which we'll all discuss his recent piece um, in the New York Times that was published under the title, I No Longer Believe in the Jewish State on July 8th. Um, Peter discusses there his vision of equality in Israel-Palestine, which is kind of um, his uh, vision for replacing uh, the long-standing idea of two states for two people. Um, so um, for that, um, purpose, we have brought together um, a very um, distinguished set of, uh, at, of panelists who I want to introduce formally in a second. But first, I want to read a short quotation from Peter's longer piece in the Jewish uh, Currents, um, which is titled Yavne, A Jewish Case for Equality in Israel-Palestine, um, in which I think he makes a really very important point he says, the traditional two-state solution no longer offers a compelling alternative to Israel's current path. It risks becoming instead a way of camouflage, camouflaging and enabling that path. It is time for liberal Zionists to abandon the goal of Jewish-Palestinian separation and embrace the goal of Jewish-Palestinian equality. And indeed, this reflects Peter's longstanding um, voice from a distinctly Jewish and I think Zionist position, uh, even in this piece, in the New York Times piece where he says, I no longer believe in a Jewish state. So to discuss all these themes, these uh, kind of provocative themes, we have with us today, uh, Fania O. Salzberger, who is um, our very own professor at the University of Haifa School of Law and um, at the Haifa Center for German and European Studies. And uh, in 2012, she published together with Amos Oz uh, the book Jews and Words with uh, Yale University Press. She has many, many more publications, which I will not list today, but has been a longstanding proponent of liberal Zionism. Uh, we have Samer Abderozak Sinjalawi, who is the chairman of the Jerusalem Development Fund. He comes to us from East Jerusalem. He's head of the diplomatic and international relations um, for the Fatah Shadow Leadership and Reform Stream. He was the president of the Palestinian Council of Young Political Leaders from 12, 2000 to 2006 and head of, Israeli and inter, of the Israeli and international file for Fatah Supreme Committee, Committee during 1994 to 2000. He was detained. He also adds in his bio that he was detained by the Israeli authorities at the age of 15 for four years during the first intifada. We have with us Gilad Shell, uh, who heads the Center for Applied Negotiations um, at the INSS. Um, and uh, he is also a, research, a senior research fellow there. Um, Attorney Shell was chief of staff and policy coordinator to former Israeli prime minister Ehud Barak 
a senior negotiator at the Camp David Summit at the Tabatox from 1999 to 2001, and a delegate in the 1994-1995 Israeli-Palestinian interim agreement negotiations under Prime Minister Rabin. And we have with us Asaf Malach, who is a scholar of nationalism and political philosophy. He's the founding director of the Jewish State Statesmanship Center in Jerusalem and the head of its ethics and international relations program um, in Merkaz Shalem. In addition, he serves as the director of the Committee for Citizenship Studies in Israel's Ministry of Education, a very interesting and I think important uh, role. And recently in an article in the uh, journal Hashiloch, he has declared the dissolution of the Zionist left and called for a neoconservative vision for Israeli society. So um, as you can see, we have a kind of uh, political diversity around the table, which I think may uh, make this event particularly interesting. And I wanna start out, start us off with a few questions to Peter. Um, and um, first, I guess on a very, very general level, um, as a longstanding proponent of the two-state solution, what made you change your mind? Was it uh, the annexation? And now that we know that the annexation has been deferred and its status is no longer very clear, does that make any difference in um, your position? Thank you. And I, I just want to say, first of all, that it's, it's both very flattering and quite daunting for me to be doing this event with a, a number of people who, although I don't know them really personally, whose work I followed for a long time, and um, and and it's 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 flattering, but it's also daunting because obviously I'm not I'm neither an Israeli nor a Palestinian, so um, um, uh, um, I engage in this conversation with a certain degree of, of trepidation. Um, um, but um, I, I would say there was not one kind of, um, you know, moment of a clear break um, in my thinking. It was, not, it was not really the prospect of formal annexation in particular, since I think that would have really just kind of ratified in many ways a status quo that already exists, a, a de facto annexation that I think has already effectively taken place. Um, it was really the process of over uh, several years essentially continuing myself to write and speak a, 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 a certain line of argument that I felt to myself as I was writing it again and again was becoming less convincing to me. Um, it just, um, it seemed to me that, you know, if you go back to the 19, early 1980s, you have people like uh, Marin Benveniste and Elias Frege, the mayor of Bethlehem um, and uh, and others saying, you know, uh, Amos Elon saying that essentially if you have 100,000 settlers in East Jerusalem in the West Bank, you can't have a, 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 a contiguous sovereign Palestinian state. And I felt that what I saw happening in the discourse was that as the numbers were moving up to 650,000 and a kind of massive infrastructure in place, what was happening was that in order to maintain the this, this intellectual edifice of two states, you were essentially, people were defining Palestinian statehood down, um, uh, both in terms of the amount of territory that it would control, the amount of sovereignty that it would have, and, and that that seemed to me to become to be to be less and less likely to kind of meet basic minimum Palestinian demands. And I also began to feel that as the the two state solution was becoming both less and less more and more remote and in some ways less and less appealing, again, both because the notions of what a Palestinian state would be were so far away from what I think the Palestinian national movement met, meant when it made this pivot towards embracing this idea starting in the 70s and then, then culminating in the 1980s, that this was not actually a vision that was likely to be able to build a mass movement around it. I think that probably also has something to do, again, also I think with the sense that the, the Palestinian Authority and the Israeli government have kind of conspired to create a pretty repressive edifice in the West Bank so that even many Palestinians, particularly younger Palestinians, see the PA as not a particularly a, appealing state in waiting anyway. Um, and so I didn't really have a, an alternative in my mind, but I, I began to feel like I could not in con good conscience continue to go and make a series of arguments that I no longer found convincing to myself. And so I decided essentially to spend 
to set a bulk of time uh, uh, to just read in a whole series of areas, to talk to a lot of people, and um, and to see whether I could come up with a with an alternative construct that seemed more convincing to me. And over time during that research, I began to kind of, something began to came to come together. And I think it was particularly informed by reading about other case studies that I felt like helped me get out of the two state paradigm a little bit. Excellent. Um, I think you've already addressed one of the next points that I wanna ask you about, which is your emphasis on, move, on the movement, um, on this idea that this uh, vision of equality will have some kind of convincing power that is greater um, than uh, the two-state uh, future that we are offered in a very, uh, albeit in a very, very kind of uh, weak way. How do you see that movement developing? And how do you see, I think this is a, a kind of problematic point for many of us, uh, the movement from what we have now to this vision of equality, obviously it will not happen overnight. So what needs to be done and how uh, might that be pursued in this area in your vision? Right, so it's a difficult question for me to answer because I would imagine that this will be primarily a, a, a Palestinian led movement um, that it simply, you know, Palestinians are the, are the community that is lacking basic rights. And so it just seems normal that it would be Palestinians who essentially in a new phase of the of, of their struggle for individual and national rights will will move towards making this call and I, I think it will be important for Jews and other people to to be part of that process but it's not it's difficult for me to talk about you know what the Palestinian national movement should do I'm not I'm not inside of it I do suggest in my essay that I think that um, the, the, the Palestinian authority at this point, I think is, is playing a counterproductive role, it seems to me. I understand why it's providing certain services that Palestinians value in terms of jobs and a certain degree of, of kind of law and order perhaps, but it's, it's, it's making Israel's control over millions of Palestinians in the West Bank who lack basic rights much easier. And I think it's also propping up what I think is now this kind of artificial edifice of a state in waiting when there is really, I think, no state in waiting. And I think that once, once the Palestinian authority is, it, once there is no longer a Palestinian authority, I think it would be easier to imagine the next phase of this movement. I think if you look at, at international Palestinian civil society activism, you already see people who are talking in the language of human rights and international law, not in the language of state of, of, of kind of national sovereignty for its own sake. And I think that that brings up one last point that I just wanna, I just wanna make, which is that it seems to me one of the important things for us to acknowledge when we talk about the two state solution is that um, the two state solution as I, I think as envisioned at least by most Israeli and diaspora Jews, which is um, a, a two state solution that preserves a Jewish state both by um, not allowing for a significant number of Palestinian refugees to return, and also by not allowing Palestinian citizens of Israel to fundamentally reimagine the character of, of the state in which they live inside the 67 lines. That that is a vision of two, that, that's a kind of a two state solution that I actually, at least upon reflection, I don't really think is a solution to begin with. I think it might be a step in the right direction, but I think ultimately any two state solution that does not provide for a just solution for Palestinian refugees and does not offer an opportunity for Palestinian citizens of Israel to feel like they are, they are equal citizens in the state in which they live is ultimately not fundamentally a solution as well. And so when one is balancing these two visions, I think one has to keep that in mind. Yeah, I'd like to come back to your point about refugees, perhaps um, both with you and with other uh, speakers here. Uh, but before that, um, I, as I noted in my introductory comments, um, at least in the essay, you make it very clear that your vision is a type of Zionism. Um, and I think that at least imagining what a Palestinian uh, reader might think, he might say, you might use your, one of your own arguments um, in respect uh, to, to this point of yours saying, well, you're thinking about Zionism as a historical, ideological, intellectual movement and not about the realities of Zionism on the ground, which were um, in large part about, um, you know, possessing lands and um, displacing populations 
and certain forms of military violence that are basically permanent in the West Bank and in Gaza. So why, if that is the case, and we need to read Zionism through its reality on the ground and not through its ideology, ideological framework, why, why should we insist on uh, holding on to that particular category? Right. So I, I would not expect that, that, that Palestinians would have a, a positive or benign vision of Zionism given their experience. And, and it's true that the kind of Zionism that I am referencing it, uh, uh, is, not the, is not, the, not the kind of Zionism that ultimately prevailed. It's a, it's a kind of minority tradition within Zionism. Um, um, but the reason that I felt it was important uh, for me, given to, to, to talk in that, um, there's something deeply precious in the existence of a vibrant Jewish society in Israel. Jewish people can do just as well if there's not a significant and thriving uh, uh, population in Israel, Palestine. I believe that um, uh, the cultural production of what Jews enabled to create, because there's a vibrant society in Israel, Palestine, has been, you know, again, the tradition of Ham has, has succeeded in, in enriching the entire Jewish world. Um, and so I would, I wanted to make that claim to, to make clear that I am making this argument in the belief that I believe that. Uh, there, there, there could remain uh, a, a thriving, vibrant Jewish society in the land, uh, in what we call Eretz Israel, in the land of Israel, um, and and that we could still consider this binational state or this confederation uh, in, to include a Jewish home. And I wanted to make that case explicitly uh, against those people who might interpret my essay as suggesting, well. I, 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 I don't really care particularly um, about whether, in fact, there remains a strong Jewish presence in Israel-Palestine. That's actually something that I care about a great deal. Okay, and, and following up on that, uh, perhaps last point for this round, if you can reflect a little bit about the role of Jewish Americans in particular in this context. This is something that you also said something about in the beginning of your own comments. But I'm kind of curious about how you perceive uh, the role of the community that you belong to in this context, uh, both as a matter of fact and in terms of uh, what uh, you know uh, you in the United States should aspire to be doing in this context. Well, so as, as I'm sure all of you know, um, um, the Jews in the United States are are quite divided. Um, um, both along generational lines and along the lines of religious observance. So um, the younger and more secular you are, the more, um, I would say, alienated you are probably from Israeli policies, and the older and more orthodox you are, the more comfortable you are with those. Um, now, for various reasons, um, I, older American Jews tend to be, a, 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 and more religiously observant American Jews tend to have more political influence um, uh, than, than the younger and secular. And that's why I think the American Jewish establishment organizations, APAC, et cetera, still you know, have a great deal of influence. Um, but I, I do think that um, a, a lot of what happens in the US will, of course, be influenced by what happens on the ground. Um, Frankly, you know, the, um, I would not expect any really significant shifts in U.S. policy um, absent shifts in, on the ground. I think it would be it would be some kind of Palestinian uprising, hopefully a nonviolent uprising, that I think will force the issue in the United States. Right now, Israel-Palestine is just simply not really at the top of the of, 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 a, of the agenda for most American politicians and activists, um, partly because things are fairly quiet on the ground and goodness knows we have enough of our own troubles. Um, but I do think that in there, if, if, if there is another moment in which Palestinians, you know, Frederick Douglass famously said, power concedes nothing without a demand, right? So when Palestinians on the ground make that demand in some form, I think that will activate the American left both Jews and non-Jews. And I, and I specifically would highlight the role of African-Americans in this conversation. I think African-Americans are gonna play an increasingly important role in the Israel-Palestine conversation in the US. And I do think it's under those circumstances, we could see the Democratic Party moving to a position um, which is significantly different than even the position that Barack Obama had in which America does go back to being willing to consider actual tangible 
consequences for Israeli policy, not something that an American president has been willing to do since George H.W. Bush in the early 1990s. Excellent. Uh, with your permission, I want to move us to Fania Ozalsbilgil now and also say to the 54 attendees um, uh, that are here with us that we are going to take questions from the audience as well uh, after we have a first round of conversation among us. So keep um, writing down, taking notes, and um, we'll try to have um, you also intervene. Um, and uh, with that said, um, Fania, um, has been a proponent of the two-state solution. I don't think she has been convinced by your article. And I want to ask her um, as a first uh, stab at this conversation to map out areas of agreement and disagreement um, within, I think, what um, can be defined following your clarification as liberal Zionism. Thank you very much, Itamar. I hope you can all hear me well. Just give me a sign if you don't. And thank you, Peter, for joining us and for laying out so well in both your recent articles and numerous interviews and here today, uh, your vision, which is uh, magnificent in, in many ways. Um, <coughs> I, I have an issue with my wish to answer Summer Abdel Razak as well before we have heard him talk, uh, because I've heard him talk before. Uh, but I will do this via a quote from Peter's New York Times article, which got me thinking, uh, both uh, uh, in a happy way and in a very sad way. Uh, at some point in the article, you spell out the fact which should surprise some readers in the United States or in Israel, that um, both young Palestinians and young Americans or young Jewish Americans seem to be moving en masse towards the one state solution, the one state dream. And I found this on the one hand very sad because it meant for me that a whole young generation of Palestinians in Palestine and beyond are abandoning the dreams of their parents or grandparents. Um, but on the other hand, I found it exhilarating, if true, that a large number of young Palestinians, especially in the Palestinian Authority's territory, um, are happy to move along to a peaceful, assertive, if need be also aggressive demand for full civil rights in a future joint state for Israelis and Palestinians. This is exhilarating news for many. What was missing from that quote, from that sentence, from that equation, were the Israeli Jews. Because not only young Israeli Jews, especially by the way, young Israeli Jews, all Israeli Jews, have a vast majority of opposition to any one state solution, except the nightmare one state solution. Not what you are dreaming, not what I'm dreaming perhaps. So I'll say something as a two states hoper, I still am, although it is diminishing fast, but you know, in, back in, I think you quoted Mehron Ben Benishti a vice mayor of Jerusalem saying in 1982 that we are five minutes before mid midnight. If we were so in 1982, where are we today? Are we one second before midnight or maybe well over? Maybe the train has left the station. I don't know. I'm a historian and I don't know because we are just in the current. We are not outside it. We are not observers from another planet. But as a two-stater, that's a strange way of putting it, but yes, as a two-stater, I would say that I, for one, will not be living in the one state you, Peter, are imagining. Because I'm persuaded that the one state you are imagining is not the one state in which I shall have to live all said and done after we have gone through any process. I fear that the numbers and the opinions 
and the sentiments and the gut feelings and the deep stomach emotions that have to do with Jewish national thinking today, nationalist thinking today, will disable this plan before it is set up. Also some Palestinians, maybe a few, but a few are enough to disrupt horribly a plan that can go um, tragically wrong. I want to go back to the moment in, uh, let's say, in between 1945 and 1948, in which, as you rightly said, your parents, my grandparents, post-Holocaust, within the Holocaust, facing the horror that we cannot imagine, we can repeat and, and, and so on, but we cannot imagine that horror, saying it is either a Jewish state, or as Herzl would put it, a state for the Jews. It doesn't have to be Jewish in a way that excludes each and every other citizen, a state for the Jews, or annihilation. And it was a truth for its time, and it was possibly more than a truth for its time. But the fact was, and we have to return to that moment, because little can we afford to neglect the horrors of the Palestinian Nakba, and little can be afforded to neglect the horrors of the Jewish tragedy in and post Holocaust. And the fear and the angst and the psychology you've written beautifully about it. It was the only truth for its time because there was no other option, as even the United Nations acknowledged, for Jews to live safely as a minority in any arrangement worldwide. Now, half my family, Peter, you know a bit more about one half than about the other half. Half my family were loving, humanist, active, assertive, uh, agricultural Zionists who wanted the nation state and were not so traumatized because they migrated here from Romania before the Second World War. But the other half, which you know better, and those who have read my father's A Tale of Love and Darkness would know that half came to the land of Israel and hoped and dreamed of an Israeli nation state, a Jewish nation state, never only for the Jews, always for all its citizens, but a Jewish nation state. Because never again did they want to be a minority in any country in the world, not even in Canada, not even in New Zealand, nor did any other state want them as a minority. And so they came. So it was a binary nation state or Holocaust situation then. And it was a historical moment, not a philosophy seminar or debating room. Hence the creation of the nation state. After which there were a few moments in which we could have or might have or should have or must have redivided the land as wished by the United Nations. We did not, we Jews did not, we Jews and Palestinians did not in some um, junctures. It is a horrible sin, not the very birth of Israel as the Jewish nation state, but the lack of will and power and imagination to reenact the original idea of two states side by side. We missed many, many trains. It may be too late, but it is still our best hope. I do not believe that 6 million out of 7 million Israeli Jews, fully inimical to the idea of a one-state solution, can be turned around in our generation. Whether they are inimical because they are social democrats, liberal, lefties, peaceniks, like myself, but still embracing the fears and the hopes of their ancestors, of their grandparents, or inimical for far worse reasons in my mind, because they are nationalist Jews who will never settle for a land in which Jews are not the majority or God forbid, the master race. I still do not see Peter and I'm towards the end of my 
uh, of these words of mapping our disagreements, I have to wear my historian's cap and remind you of the difference between a utopian socialism and so-called scientific socialism, Marxism. I am not a great fan of either, but utopian socialism just laid out a beautiful plan, usually on a remote island in the Atlantic Ocean and said, okay, guys, you've got the scheme, now go there, do, do it. Scientific socialism, which understood the uh, haplessness, the fragility of utopian socialism, incorporated an inner imperative, which was called in invariable publications, simply what to do, what is there to do, that action must be, must be incorporated in theory. When it comes to your um, dream, I hope you don't mind if I call it a dream, not in a derogatory way uh, at all. And some dreams, by the way, do come true, never as we wish them, but they do. Uh, does not incorporate, perhaps for good reasons, as you said, you are neither an Israeli nor a Palestinian. You cannot tell people what to do, but you do expect, interestingly, the Palestinians to take up this uh, idea and to work it out somehow. How? What about Gaza? What about two, almost two million Palestinians living under Hamas? Is Hamas also part of your equation with the IRA in, uh, in Northern Ireland or the ANC in uh, South Africa? Can Hamas deliver this good? And if not, where are we? Well, what about the numerous Palestinians, maybe a minority now among them youngsters, I'd be happy to hear, who still want to get back all the land and by force. What do we do with them? Their own people tell them what? What kind of an argument are you or are we trying to, uh, to dictate or to uh, instruct to the Palestinians? They've handled such arguments, are still handling such arguments. I don't see them getting to the full one state plan as imagined here. Uh, I fear a Lebanonization. Lebanon had wonderful agreements about sharing the power in all sorts of equilibriums and algorithms between the different the three major ethnic groups. Look at Lebanon, pity the nation. I fear that as my late father said repeatedly, and again, you know, I'm not quoting him elsewhere, these are my views, but here I do want to quote him. Any one state would become, by definition, an Arab state, perhaps prior or perhaps following a horrible phase of apartheid. Now, if I am, and I will end here, doomed to live within a Jewish minority community in any country in the world, I'm not sure I want it to be Palestine, Israel, not under an Arab majority. I haven't seen any minorities, stuff what I'm saying, any minorities in the Middle East that are non-Arab and or non-Muslim, farewell. Why should we, after all the hate, after all the bad blood, why should we? So if I am doomed to be a minority, I shall exile myself once again like my forebears, to the safest country in the world when the moment comes. I don't know what it will be. I am sorry to be a party uh, wrecker here. I still not hold you. on. I still hold on to the two-state two solution, not because I think it's wonderful, not because I think it's easily doable, not because I think it's currently conceivable, but because it is only slightly less frightening perhaps still slightly more doable and conceivable than the dream of a one state solution in the style of utopian socialism. Thank you, wow, that was a um, uh, very strong Fania um, and gives us a lot of food for thought. I want to um, not give you the permission to respond at this time, Peter. Uh, we'll have responses from you um, together after we hear everyone. Uh, I would rather like to move to uh, Samer Abdurrazak Um, who is a proponent 
of the one state vision from uh, the Palestinian side. I would like you, Samer, if you can, uh, to address a couple of things that came up already in this conversation. One is this idea that there is a movement towards uh, one state and one state of statism in the Palestinian uh, community, in the uh, Palestinian citizens in the West Bank and Gaza, maybe also in the diaspora. Uh, is that really the case in your view? Um, and how does it connect to historical visions of one democratic state in Palestine? Uh, I also am kind of curious of hearing you on uh, an issue that Fania really emphasized and Peter also um, discussed in his uh, piece, which is um, Jewish-Israeli security in the area. Um, what can we do if we are to embark on such a vision in order to um, ensure that we don't we do not slide into a kind of uh, civil war scenario if you have um thoughts about that i think we would be very um uh, happy to hear them summer well good afternoon and uh, thanks to host me today i'm i'm very glad and happy and honored to be with all of you i think uh, fania has uh, said uh, some very challenging issues and uh, i really can understand uh, most of it but uh, i really understand also that History is a catalog of uh, a lot of impossible events. Uh, um, uh, let me start by telling you that um, it's easy now for the Palestinians to be courage enough to recognize that, yes, there is a link for the Jewish people towards this land. Uh, there is a right, there is a, a claim. We understand it, we recognize it, uh, but uh, we believe that it's not the only claim we are also having a same claim to the same land. Uh, maybe our claim is a little bit stronger because it lasted longer and it's more, more recent. But uh, uh, having a claim to this land by any side does not mean that he has the right to drive the other side out. So we have a destiny of being uh, linked to the same piece of land uh, and we need to be courage to recognize the other side the other legitimate right of the other side to be here. Uh, and I can tell you that most of the Palestinians now uh, have courage enough to say, uh, we recognize the Holocaust and we respect the memory of Holocaust and all its effects. And we need to be very sensitive when addressing this issue. But also we would like to see that the Israelis have the same courage to recognize that uh, there was a Palestinian disposition from the land, and there is a suffer, and there is an occupation. Uh, and uh, talking about a one-state solution or two-state solution, I think uh, theoretically we have experienced for 70 years the two-state solution. And uh, for me and for a lot of Palestinians, it tends to be a lie. This is the, the option that we have already experienced. What we did not experience is the one-state solution. I know both are difficult. Your argument, Fania, is, 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 could be valid, but at least we, we I, am, I am one of the Palestinians who has been born under occupation, lived my whole life in, in, in occupation. I will die under occupation, and I don't see uh, uh, any hope in the two-state solution. And I cannot accept to be uh, living as a third-class citizen, because the reality in Israel well, uh, Israel could be democrat a democracy, uh, democracy in, uh, in, in the sense of having elections, which unfortunately Netanyahu keeps winning these days. Uh, but uh, is it really a democracy uh, uh, among the, the 14 million people uh, living in, in the same land? No, oh, because there are three types of citizens now. First class citizens, the Israeli Jews who vote and are, their vote is legitimate to form a government. Uh, uh, Israeli Arabs who vote, but their votes is not legitimate to form a, to form a government or, or be part of it. And then there are the Palestinians who are objects with no rights at all. I cannot have a say on the government that determines every single part of my life, every single detail of my life. So, uh, and we have tried everything. We have tried the uh, peaceful resistance through the Intifada. There has been violent uh, resistance. There have been negotiation. And, and negotiation is, 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 is really uh, is a big trick. 
negotiate what? We sit, we sit on the table and I, I think Mr. Glad Sher has very big experience in, in, in the negotiation. We sit on the table and in front of us, we have an opponent that is a hundred times more powerful in economy, uh, 13 times uh, more powerful in uh, GDP per capita. In military, it's maybe one, uh, 100,000 times more powerful than us. So how can you negotiate with this? Uh, there is no balance for negotiation. If the two-state solution is the best one, okay, with all the happiness, uh, give us a state. For how long do we need to, to wait more? Uh, and I think, why, why to negotiate? Let's go to international arbitration. And for me, maybe, uh, you know, the international law is more 181 and not, uh, uh, not the UN resolution after the war of 67. So let's go to, to international arbitration and let's, uh, let's, let's have the international community decide among us when there is a law and there is a conflict uh, or a, a, a claim against this law, people go to the court. So let's go to the international community and let them find a solution for this. But continuing uh, for us to stick with the two-state solution is, is meaning giving a curtain smoke curtain to the occupation, to the continuation of the occupation. The Oslo framework is just intending to repackage the occupation, give it more time, and we are fed up with this. And that's the motivation for the Palestinians to start looking for an alternative. And from, from, from here, everybody is more surrendering to the right that um, it's better for us to call for one state and for equal rights. Uh, and you know, there is a, a say for uh, Franz Kafka, uh, life is a war, uh, the war against your, yourself, against your circumstances, and against those stupids who created these circumstances. If you go to the UN Resolution 181, uh, the mandate power, UK itself, abstained voting to the partition. So the, 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 the UK that was uh, on the ground for 30 years, knowing all the details, did not believe uh, in, in the partition plan at that time. And uh, we, we took this option, we experienced everything possible, and we simply uh, came to deadlock. Uh, I, I don't think that it makes a lot of difference whether uh, there was annexation or not, because what's really changed uh, or killed the two-state solution is the facts and realities on the ground. I think even the two-state solution was killed long ago when, when, uh, when somebody pulled the trigger against Rabin and assassinated him. It was killed again and buried when Sharon sent his tanks and his uh, tanks were scratching the windows of Arafat, the other partner in, 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 in the two-state uh, option. And uh, since that day, uh, we have been, you know, continuing, I think the only uh, people who are really suffering from the current situation is the Palestinians. Uh, now, uh, the, the situation is very comfortable for all the others. This year, there has, uh, it has been a very safe year for the Israelis. There was, there hasn't been one victim of terror from the Israeli side. N no one was killed from the Israeli side. Uh, there was tens or hundreds of Palestinians who were killed. We, we are shot like dogs in, in streets, like Iyad Halak, and nobody cares. We lost uh, the hope that the international community will even interfere because the, even the international com community, they are giving uh, a lot of immunity to Israel. They are complicit to the current situation. And as far as there is no noise in their capitals, they don't care. So for the international community, for them, even they are more comfortable to continue. Uh, in, in the current situation. Uh, I really uh, respect a lot the courage of Peter Benat. Uh, he, he, he gave uh, a legitimacy for an international debate on, on the issue. And uh, it is very, very much more difficult to sell a complex truth than a simple lie. Uh, sticking to the two-state solution is very simple for everybody. The challenge is to look into other difficult uh, uh, I think we have 
a lot of challenges uh, inside the Palestinian society, but the, the biggest challenge facing us today is the absence of effective and unified leadership. Uh, the personalized and democratic rule of the current president who turned all the institutions of PLO and PNA uh, to consolidate his rule and to implement his decisions also on the, on the Hamas uh, side in Gaza. Uh, uh, this kind of weak and undemocratic uh, leadership, I think uh, there is a lot of uh, doubts about the legitimate uh, representation now in the peace process or in front of the international community. I, I don't understand why the whole world respected that Israel needed more than one year and three elections until the Israeli society has a government that uh, believes uh, it rep uh, represents them. And nobody cares that the last Palestinian election was in 2005 and 2006, uh, which was a very bad experience. I, don't, I know that most of the people here on the panel don't like Hamas, but Hamas, won a transparent and fair elections. And it was wrong for us, Fatah and the Palestinians and the whole world to deny them the right to rule for four, four years. And that created the, the, the division, the demo, demographic division between the West Bank and Gaza, which is a, a very big challenge. I think now the Palestinians should try to work very hard in reforming uh, our uh, political institutions. I think we should not neglect uh, the PLO. We should try to reform the PLO, uh, make it more representative, make it more accountable. And once we have a leadership that is fairly elected by the 13, 14 million Palestinians, uh, and, and it's easy to, to organize uh, an election, uh, electronic elections for every Palestinian who would like to, to, to choose the leadership because the main challenge is not only satisfying the Palestinians inside the West Bank and Gaza. The, the, our, our biggest challenge is the refugees. If, if you have a solution that does not really allow these people to exercise the right to return to their home, and their home is, is unfortunately inside Israel. For them, you know, in, in, in Jalazon, a refugee camp, People don't go out and live in Ramallah because they don't think that Ramallah is their uh, their home. Their home is somewhere else. So I, I understand about the need for a Jewish homeland. Uh, and uh, but, well, uh, I don't think that, uh, you know, uh, Israel has provided secret solution for every Jews in the world because 50% of the Jews are living as minorities outside. And uh, they are comfortable. I, I think one of the uh, one of the things that the Zionists did not uh, manage to achieve is convincing most of the Jewish Europeans to come to Israel before uh, 48. Until now, most of the Jews, majority of the Jews, live as minority outside, and they are safe. And the responsibility of their safety is for the other governments. But this is not for me to have a say. This is something that should be, you know, discussed inside the Israeli society. For me, what is important, we are here. We are 13 million Palestinians. Whenever you want to find a solution, it should be including our rights. We are human beings, we are equal, and we need to be part of the solution. This mutual recognition should come from our own sake. It should not be attached with political conditions. It should come from our own sake as humans. We should believe that the other is an equal human. And I, I, I can see myself as part of one state, uh, where is, uh, the government is, uh, is, um, could be you know, majority of uh, Jewish uh, ministers. Uh, and, and, and I can see that uh, if, I've, if I am equal, I have the sense of equality, I can be very loyal to this uh, country. And, uh, most of, of, of the concerns of this country to keep security of all its citizens, and I can be part of it. Now the one and a half million Palestinians inside Israel are becoming the progressive uh, movement inside Israel, the symbols of democracy. I've, I've seen that uh, there was a question that was addressed to Israeli Jews and Israeli Arabs. What is the most important institution inside the country? Uh, Israeli Jews answered the IDF. And the, the Arab uh, Israelis say the Supreme Court. 
So in a way or another, the Palestinian side, Israel, are becoming the left, are becoming the progressive, the democratic, the, the, the democratic power movement inside Israel. We can add to this. Uh, I think I can say more uh, about uh, about this, but uh, maybe it will come in the second round of. Thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Samers. Thank you so much. Um, we're moving uh, to Gilad Shir, Um and um, to Gilad, I would like to address the question that I think, uh, at least in my mind, um, comes from listening to all of the speakers thus far. Uh, I think it's a question that Samuel put on the table very. Um, straightforwardly, which is um, assuming that we are waiting for a two-state solution to appear in the future, what happens to the fundamental rights and especially the political rights, the rights of participation of those people who are in the West Bank under um, significant Israeli <laughs> governmental authority? And is it uh, consonant with the idea of Israel as a democracy to continue um, to have them at this stage not exercising rights, even if they choose to do so. That's my uh, question, which is a question that I've also thought about uh, myself as a scholar. I, of course, uh, also would like to hear any response you have to what we've heard so far. Uh, but if you can address this point too, I'd be extremely grateful. I will address this point. Thank you, uh, uh, Itamal. I will address this point uh, at the later stage of my, uh, my few words here. Uh, but I would like to uh, first start by, by saying that um, for the last 30 years, since the uh, outset of the uh, political process between Israelis and Palestinians, we did not try everything. And this is, uh, I, I address one of the points that um, that the summer uh, made, because altogether, all the rounds of negotiations and talks on permanent agreement combined, perhaps, uh, you know, we combined all of them, it comprises perhaps 10% of the time. So I am not prepared at this stage to gamble on my fate uh, as an Israeli Jew, a liberal, a human being, by experimenting one state which would be a disaster for Israelis and Palestinians alike. The truth is, and that's my bottom line uh, in this conversation, the truth is that the two-state solution is still doable, is still attainable, and is, sti and is still indispensable for, for uh, both parties. I keep on checking my, uh, my credo uh, consistently uh, throughout the years, and I'm sorry to say that um, I was not convinced by, uh, by Peter's arguments, as brilliant as they were, uh, nor by uh, Summers. This, because, you know, despite so many challenges that um, are inherent in the Israel-Palestinian uh, peace process, only a two-state reality uh, will work for the benefit of, of a Jewish democratic Israel would be consistent with the Zionist vision and provide self-determination to the Palestinians. By the way, I'm not talking about a Jewish state. I'm talking about a democratic nation state of the Jewish people, the only one. So I, I personally call it the uh, saving the, the Zionist enterprise, if, if, uh, if you need definitions to be, uh, to be put on the table, because the aim should be uh, to achieve a defensible border that encompasses a democratic nation state of the Jewish people based on values and ethics uh, of the quasi-constitutional 1948 Declaration of Independence. On our side, it requires courage, leadership, national responsibility, because otherwise, from an Israeli perspective, Israel will face not only imposed arrangements and agreements and deterioration towards uh, the one state, but also delegitimization and demonization and international isolation, and uh, most importantly, the erosion of Israel's and the Jewish people's uh, core values. Therefore, in my opinion, the two states for two people reality 
is indispensable and, and um, it is attainable uh, throughout a series of transitional phases, perhaps interim agreements, independent steps to be taken, uh, constructive independent state, uh, steps to be taken by uh, either parties, all compliant with a continuous negotiation process. Uh, I believe that, uh, that um, creating the reality that would preserve the conditions for a, an eventual two-state solution uh, would also create on the ground a reality that is the preparatory stage for a two uh, distinct nation states that, uh, that have a border between them in, and in each one of them uh, there are values that are encompassed within these borders. It, it requires in Israel an internal uh, dialogue and, um, and a participatory process uh, to amend all kinds of schisms within, within our society. And I believe it does uh, require the same within the Palestinian society. I believe that uh, along with taking off the table temporarily or... Uh, let's hope permanently, uh, the un unilateral annexation of territory in the West Bank, of Palestinian territory in the West Bank, I, I think it would make sense for an Israeli government to invest in an effort to delineate or demarcate uh, even provisionally the border between Israel and the Palestinians. This would be a first step uh, uh, towards separation into two nation states even if a full-fledged peace agreement is not in the cards at present. And um, uh, I, I, can, I can share the contour of, uh, of a possible two-state for two-people uh, framework. And I believe that today, uh, post the Emirati uh, breakthrough, it appears that Israel is positioned uh, to more likely achieve broader agreement on these principles among Arab states, and I believe it serves both the Palestinian cause and the Israeli uh, interests and, and are, is consistent with both uh, respective national interests. So first, I believe that we need to resolve the historic conflict between the Palestinian people, the Jewish people in Israel. Um, and, um, and, we, and, and, and we have to, uh, uh, to conduct a, a repartition of the former territory of British Mandatory Palestine between a sovereign Palestinian state on plus minus 22% of the land and the state of Israel on plus minus 78% of the land based on the June 4, 1967 lines with agreed upon changes, swap of lands, etc., including on the one part the incorporation of most of the Jewish settlers in the main settlement blocks that will be annexed to Israel and compensation for this through, uh, as I said, land swaps. Now, we need to define the Palestinian state, and here I believe that I address your question, uh, Itamar, again, um, as a national home for the Palestinian Arab people. And the definition of Israel as a national home for the Jewish people. Um, I have to talk about the, uh, the refugees, of course. I believe that uh, the right of return to Israel for refugees, uh, except for um, you know, a case-by-case -case basis upon, based on humanitarian grounds, family reunifications, etc., there will be no right of return into Israel proper. Palestinian refugees will be rehabilitated within their states of residence or the Palestinian state to be established. Uh, other states that would express willingness to absorb them, uh, international mechanisms to be put in place to rehabilitate the refugees and assist the Arab states that absorb them into their territories. Uh, we have the major sticking point is Jerusalem. Uh, it should serve two capitals, Jewish Yerushalayim, Arab Al-Quds, which both of them will be separated uh, by a clear and defined line of sovereignty. The historic basin, what we call around the old city of Jerusalem, should be administered by a special and perhaps international regime 
that uh, would ensure freedom of access, worship to all religions. Uh, we have security arrangements that should be based on Palestine being uh, demilitarized as a state, as well as long-term international guarantees to both Israel and Palestine to ensure regional stability. Um, last but not least, uh, we need a process, a long process of perhaps a generation or more of education towards peace and coexistence between the two people, but no one state. Now, all political initiatives um, ultimately lead to the same basic, uh, are based uh, on the same principles um, for, for a permanent settlement. And I believe that this is the time, there's never a good time to, uh, um, to endeavor getting there. But now is, is not less good a time than any other time to take action, uh, particularly based on the trends that were reflected in uh, the agreement between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, as well as the agreements that are likely to follow. So not only bilateral Israeli-Palestinian negotiations on the two-state solution, and yes, we need to discuss that more, and yes, we need to negotiate that more between us. We cannot have an imposed solution by the Europeans, by the Americans, by, a, by the Arab states, or whatever, or a dictation by the Arab League. We need to bilaterally negotiate, Israelis and Palestinians. It's a 20-minute drive between Ramallah and Jerusalem, uh, between the Mukata and Balfour, uh, and, we need to, uh, and we need to press on that. But we also uh, need to, to have some regional outlook on, uh, on a possible regional involvement uh, to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and some independent steps that would complement that on the way to a two-state solution. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Gilad. Um, moving to Asaf Malach. Um, uh, Asaf, thanks for uh, being with us uh, again. Thanks again for being with us today. I think I would like to address to you a rather uh, general question, uh, which is, how did you respond when reading uh, Peter's uh, New York Times piece and perhaps the longer essay uh, in the Jewish Currents? What were your thoughts? And also, if you can share with us what kind of vision for the future of Israel-Palestine you would propose, be it a two-state or a one-state uh, vision, how should we be imagining it? How should we Im be imagining your vision for the future? Thank you for inviting me to uh, take part in this uh, important discussion um, and to hear all these uh, point of views on the situation. First of all, it was very interesting and also to hear now the process of changing the, the uh, traditional paradigms in our area. And especially I would like to mention that I, it, I, I, I very like the way uh, Peter described the way he felt how things that we wrote less and less convince us. And I think every person, only a donkey, uh, doesn't change his mind, uh, 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 feel that uh, feeling where uh, things and beliefs and uh, different things that we uh, wrote less and less convince us. And this is very interesting. I agree also uh, with Peter about the weakness of the national, uh, Palestinian national movement in the past and in the present, but for a different reason. And I think that the disagreement between us and between me and maybe all the speakers here, and here in, I, in a, in a, in a uh, minority opinion, but I in a way represent the way of uh, uh, maybe most of the Israelis and it's uh, a government policies for many years, 
that I deny the problem. Now, I do not deny that there is a problem, but I deny the way you put it, the problem. Because the real problem is not the Palestinian Israel, Israeli, Israel conflict. The problem is the Arab Israeli conflict. This is the right way to look at the problem. And only if we be courage enough to, to look at this problem, we will have a, a right direction to go. Now, I think that the adoption, and also when uh, I have read uh, uh, Peter's interesting paper, I felt that, that the adoption of the reframing of the problem by the Arab leaders after 67 for their interest to attack Israel. We know that they couldn't care less about Palestinian nation and Palestinian state and Palestinian rights and their own population rights, human rights, till today. And especially the Palestinian rights and Palestinian nation till 67. But after 67, after they defeat, was, was, they were defeated in the Six Day War, they changed the configuration of the situation and started to speak about Palestinian Israeli conflict and created the image of a Palestinian nation to uh, uh, weaken the Israeli moral image in the public, international public discourse. Now we can't ignore that basic fact when we come to deal with the uh, uh, real problem because all the, all the question of nationality in the Middle East is a huge problem and we have no time to do to come into it but but it's so clear that the spring the arab spring showed how much problematic it is now there are for people uh, a different kind of uh, affiliation circles uh, uh, circles of uh, affiliation and the place of nationality and nation state especially in the Arab world and in the Muslim world is very weak. And this is one of the reasons for the Arab Spring and the crisis in Syria and in Libya, in Yemen and so on. There are real problems and the scholars of the Middle East wrote a lot about it. Uh, Iran or Egypt are, are uh, exceptions. Uh, in any case, so, it's so strange to think about the Palestinian nation as a, a nation with a deep sources. It's, it's an illusion which was created to attack Israel. It's so clear. Now, you know, there are different historians about the origin of the Palestinian con national consciousness. Some Palestinian historians put it in the beginning of the 20th century, others in after 67, 87. In any case, it's clear they were in the beginning parts of the, the, the population who identify with this ideal, but most of them uh, uh, identify with, again, artificial idea of pan-Arab nationalism, which also caused such a problem to the Middle East after it failed, after 67 and a, 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 a Nazi failure. So to understand the problem and the solution, we have first of all to, to return and frame the right uh, uh, problem. So the right if, and, and from my point of view, maybe only another one comment on that topic. There are maybe thousands 
nations on earth. Maybe hundreds, maybe six hundreds, maybe five thousands. It depends on the scholar that you that you ask. Okay, six hundred to five thousand. There are less than two hundred states in the world. So it's clear that if you look at the globus, it's so far from the 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 uh, theoretical uh, uh, formulates of uh, uh, self-determination right or uh, uh, whatsoever. So to try to take out one piece of the puzzle in the Middle East, no human rights, no self-determination rights in Jordan, in Syria, in Egypt, in any, in any place on the Middle East. No such approach, no such reality. It's so far from reality. It's caused so much problems. Arabs kill Arabs on a daily basis in the Middle East, as uh, Ben Dorimi showed so uh, excellent in his uh, 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 The Industry of Lies. And to take one piece of the puzzle, as Peter did in his piece, and to try to solve the problem of uh, 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 Palestinian nationalism or human rights. Now, so for that reason, first of all, I, I think that we have to know that the Palestinian identity exists, but is a result of a process. It's a weak identity, which is a result of a process which was created mainly to attack Israel. Now there is a real problem for the state of Israel. There is a real problem that we have here millions of uh, uh, Arabs without full human rights, without full citizenship rights. This is a real problem for us. But again, we can't relate it as a problem that would be solved by theoretical equations or formulates. So to make it short, I would like to mention, there is another uh, clear uh, 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 point of departure that we should remember the, our rights in Judea and Samaria in the, in the West Bank, there is Jewish originally right. This is the original Eretz Israel, original our, our historical homeland. So uh, this is the reason also by, by uh, uh, important interpretations of the international law. But for moral point of view, this is part of our land. So we have to remember what is the real problem? The real problem is not settlement. It's not, it is not, not uh, about a Palestinian nation. The problem is about the citizens, the Arab citizens, and how we can solve it. This is the problem. Now, if again, we look at the source of the problem, it's clear that it's the real, a real problem with the direction that, uh, that uh, uh, Peter suggested. I agree about the direction, maybe in a minute, I will tell what is uh, uh, my opinion about the right direction to, to uh, a right and justice, uh, a just policy. But uh, uh, I agree, and I think it's very important, the, the, the undermining or the undermining of the uh, uh, traditional paradigms, it's very important, but we have to, take the new opportunity or the new opportunities that the reality uh, gives us uh, while Israel become more and more strong uh, 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 during the last decade. And in general, again, I, I'll try to, to make two directions that I think are uh, uh, important to, uh, uh, to think about. One is Israel should apply its sovereignty to own areas in Judea and Samaria 
in which there is an option to give full uh, uh, citizenship to the population. And for example, the plan to uh, apply sovereignty, sovereignty on uh, area C is a good example for such direction. This will be, will be a gradual way to solve the problem without changing the character of Israel as a nation state, with, which is as opposed to the way Peter put it in his article, this is a guarantee to the democratic character of Israel. And, so, and, and Summer and Peter, I, I don't agree with you about the Israeli Arab population. They really, on the political sphere, they adopt a liberal language to attack Israel again. And maybe also to, uh, before their pain. I, I, I don't uh, uh, neglect this uh, dimension. But, but in their society, they are liberals and Democrats. They are a, exa an example of a, a democratic way of life. The, the, uh, uh, the state of, uh, of women in uh, their society, the relation to gays, the corruption in the local authorities and so on, the, the, the uh, murders in the uh, Israeli Arab society. They are not an example for a democratic and liberal state. So I think there is a, 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 a deep mistake in putting the, uh, the uh, situation in that way. So I return one direction, is to apply sovereignty over different areas. The other way is to create different kind of autonomies in the area. We should not take on our shoulders the duty to create a, 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 a whole Palestinian state for Palestinian nation. There is no such a nation. There is Palestinian identity, and I have no time to, 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 uh, to enlarge this uh, 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 difference, but it's clear. There is such identity, but there is no absolute na Palestinian nation different from the people in Jordan or in uh, uh, all the Arab area. So this is a direction to have different autonomies, we have again to look on the globus and to see there are different kinds of uh, 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 sovereignty, different kinds of the, the, the uh, again, theoretical formulates doesn't fit the reality in many places in the world. I don't know why the USA haven't uh, 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 give full citizenship to Puerto Rico. I don't know why, millions of people. The question, maybe historical question, but this is a reality. So it's good enough for us. You know, it's good enough. It's not an ideal, but it's good enough for us if there will be a viable or different autonomous in this area, which imp really improve the economic and the, the uh, democratic level of the Palestinian life, even though it, wa it won't uh, uh, solve the old problems. And I think that uh, according to my uh, uh, description, by chance, and it's only by chance, but because in history, it's not happened in most of the cases, but here by chance, the justice fit to the structure of reality. Thank you, Asaf, uh, for this uh, eloquent uh, uh, exposition of your uh, position. I want, to, we're now at 520. Uh, we have until six, and I want to hear the audience as well, but I want to give Peter a chance to respond to what we have heard so far. Um, and um, Peter, uh, the floor is yours to respond to any of the points that we have heard. Um, I think that, um, it would be worthwhile to uh, expand more given what we have heard on the issue of how to get from here to there. I think that came up in a number of uh, sets of comments. And with regard to the last set of comments, Asaf Malach, I am curious to hear whether you um, agree with Asaf that the political model 
that he uh, characterizes is indeed a democracy? And if not, what is it? And, uh, you know, at least in my mind, and it's not an original point at this stage, the category of apartheid comes up. Um, I would be curious to ask, um, is Israel an apartheid state or is uh, the model that Asaf describes um, an apartheid state? And if so, what kind of moral, political, and legal purchase does that category have today? Thank you. Thank you. There's so much. You know, I want to just say first at an emotional level for me, particularly listening to Fania, there's something very odd for me about this whole experience. You know, um, in a sense, uh, the person I agree with on this panel is, is Samer, right? Um, and it's almost like falling in, some, in love with a woman who's not your wife. You know, I mean, I'm a Jew. I'm not a pure universalist. I'm not someone, I care very deeply about the Jewish people. Um, and, and so there's something both extraordinary and also something very painful and strange. It's, so again, it's almost like the, I can only think about the metaphor of having an affair with a woman who is not the mother of your one's own children, you know, um, and especially living to listening to Fania, frankly, and you know, who are your, your father have been people that have influenced my thinking a lot. So it's not a small thing for me to, to, to shift in a different direction. Um, I would say that, um, I, I, I want to start with this question about, about not wanting to be a minority. Um, and um, because I actually, I, 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 I hear that language a lot, but I would, I would respond this way. It's quite possible that Israeli Jews are already a minority uh, of the people in the land, but in between the river and the sea. If not already a minority, quite possibly would be a minority quite soon. So I don't, and I think there is one state now I mean, Gilad shared, talked about not wanting to experiment with one state. In my view, there, Israel has been experimenting with one state since 1967. So to me, I would reframe the question as not that Jews don't want to live as a minority. It's that Jews don't want to live without power. It's one thing to be, a, it's, it's okay to be a minority, frankly. So you find out a census that there are 55% of the people now are Palestinians between the river and the sea. I don't think that keeps Israelis up at night particularly, as long as Israeli Jews maintain power because the prospect of not having power is very frightening for many Jews. Um, and, and I recognize that, of course, it comes out of a deep and real trauma. But I also think it's important sometimes for us to get outside of the Jewish story and to try to look at other situations around the world where you've had one population that has rights living alongside another and to recognize that this terror of not having power is not only our terror because of our history of oppression. It was also the terror that white South Africans had. It was the terror, Protestants in Northern Ireland had this terror. Amer whites in America had this power, they, uh, this terror. They all had this terror in which they had built up a narrative in which they, they came to the belief that if they did not maintain power, if they gave the possibility to another group of being able to have an equal voice in politics, that it would mean something apocalyptic. Um, and my, part of what I try to do in the piece by referencing some political science research and looking, trying to look carefully at some other models is that my argument is actually that in, if you are in a deeply divided society or a binational society, which I think Israel-Palestine is, that those societies are more peaceful and more stable when everyone has a voice in government. And that the fears that 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 Fani and others, you know, referenced about about Hamas um, and and about what it would mean for Jews to live here, it seems to me we are creating our own nightmare if we entrench a permanent one-state reality in which Palestinians lack basic rights. Because you know, there's this phrase that is popular in the United States now, but it has a certain deep wisdom, and the phrase is "no justice, no peace," right? Which is to say, oppression is violence. And when you commit the violence of oppression on others, you are making it more likely that that violence will be visited back on you. And one of the reasons that I think it is significant to look at the behavior of Palestinian citizens of Israel is that even as second-class citizens, we see that their ability to express themselves politically in some way, even though as Sama rightly said, they can't really form governments, I think is a big part of the reason that there is so little violence by Palestinian citizens of Israel. One of the things, if you look at the way 
If you look at the way that the, that the British talked about the IRA in the 1980s, or white South Africans talked about the ANC, or even Americans talked about people in, in, the, in, the, in the civil rights movement, you also see this feeling that these are people who, if we give them an inch, once they gain power, they will be terrifying in what they will do to us. And I think actually what we see again and again is that human beings are human beings. And when people have the, of an opportunity to express themselves and have the opportunity at a decent life nonviolently, very, very few people actually choose the option of wanting to kill or be killed. Now, again, maybe that makes me a, a romantic and a, and a utopian of the kind that diaspora Jews tend to be, maybe so. Um, um, I'm also the child of South Africans, and I, I, I suppose that also has had an impact. I, I think that um, in terms of the question of realism, again, I think it's important to remember, yes, Fania rightly said, um, is this something that is imaginable that Israeli Jews would sign up for now? Absolutely not. But I think it is just worth remembering even a decade before the Good Friday Agreement in, in, in Northern Ireland, or a decade before the end of apartheid, or even as recently, as late as the 1940s in the United States, if you talk to most white Southerners or white Americans at all and said, can you imagine a white soldier serving under a black officer in the US Army? And they would have said, it was unthinkable, right? Um, and so political movements, moral movements, make the unthinkable thinkable. Um, and my, what, I, uh, what I hope for is a, vi a moral movement that creates a vision of, 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 a, of a place in which both Palestinians and Jews have safety and dignity. And I think we have seen that although as difficult as that is, it's been possible. Now people will say, well, it's not possible in the Middle East. Um, look at Lebanon. I, I try to suggest in my, in my argument that Israel, Israel Palestine has certain advantages that are very important in looking at the possibility of stability in a democratic binational society. A very high literacy rate, which correlates quite strongly. A very high GDP. It's also worth remembering, I mean, when we once talk about Lebanon, we also need to remember that one of the reasons Lebanon was so destabilized was the, prop, was the presence of Palestinian refugees. That was a deeply destabilizing uh, 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 in reality. Israel's invasion of Lebanon in the 1980s was also deeply destabilizing. Israel-Palestine would be a much stronger state as opposed to Lebanon, which was a weak state which was preyed upon by both Israel and Syria. Um, the last point I would make is to those for whom I have not convinced you, but you believe that controlling millions of people without basic rights is morally intolerable. I would say if that's still your view and you are still a, view, a proponent of the two-state solution, it seems to me the logical position to take would be to support international pressure on Israel. Um, because I don't see how one can read the last, certainly the last decade of Israeli political history and come to the conclusion that if Israel is allowed to basically maintain its control over millions of Palestinians at very low cost, that Israel will change course. It seems to me, if you really want to maintain the two-state solution, then I would encourage people to be willing to be open to forms of international pressure, including the conditioning of American military aid that forces Israeli Jews to realize that there is a price for holding millions of Palestinians without basic rights. Because it seems to me, if you don't force Israeli Jews to recognize that there is a price, and I say a price, God willing, a price that includes no violence, but a price, then it seems to me you are giving a tremendous gift to Benjamin Netanyahu and to all his successors who basically have convinced Israeli Jews they can have their cake and eat it too. Thanks. Um, we have, as you may have seen in the question in the chat area, we have um, you know multiple questions at this stage um, from uh, our audience, both to you and to other panelists. I think one uh, thread that um, goes through a number of questions, and that's why I would like to flag it, is the question of confederation. Um, many people here, uh, several people here, have asked in different ways why are we speaking about either one or two states? And not about um, a confederation. Uh, a person, one person has uh, mentioned other um, models around the world for that, including Belgium. And I think that you um, did address that issue, also based on existing visions for confederation that we have here. Um, one of which, um, Miron Benvenisti, was very material in um, articulating. So I'm wondering uh, both, this, and now this is to you and also to other panelists, how do you see uh, the relationship between the question of confederation, two states, and one state? Is there any, pref any particular preference to one model 
or the other? Or is, as I understand you being say, you saying basically, that um, confederation is just one more way of thinking about one state? I, I think that's kind of what I got from your article. Go to, to other folks. Say again? Do you want me to do you want me to respond or do you uh, want to open it up? If you'd like to go first, uh, go ahead. And other folks on the panel, if you want to um, raise your hand, um, you can then speak. Or if you, yeah, I, I think raise hand would probably be, be the best way to do this without creating mayhem. But if you want to go first, um, uh, you're mm -hmm. No, no, I just went on for a long time. Why don't you go to, to some of the other folks and you can come back to me later. OK, so um, I, I think I'd like to set this, pose this question to Samer, if you would like to address this question of confederation. Does it make a difference if we're thinking about one state uh, or a confederation? Um, and maybe uh, to one or two others as well. Samer, do you, would you like to address this? I see you, Gilad. Thank you. And I will uh, get, get to you on this. Well, uh, well I think. Uh, we need to have uh, a lot of experts uh, discussing these different versions of uh, possibilities. I mean, one thing that we have learned uh, as Palestinians is that it's not useful that we think alone. Uh, it's more useful that we uh, think together with the, with the whole world uh, to try to develop some kind of um, um, a, a proper solution that is uh, very well studied. But basically, uh, as Palestinians, we have lost hope of of, uh, uh, of the international law. We think that international law serves only those who possess power. It could serve uh, USA, it could serve Israel, it does not serve Palestinians. There is imbalance on, on the table, and this uh, uh, imbalance on the table can be uh, gapped only if we try to use something different. And, and from here, politicizing the Palestinian problem uh, does not give it, give it enough moral power while putting it to the human rights basis and addressing it to the world using very peaceful tactics in, in, in making our voice uh, heard by the world, creating peaceful voice noises in all the capitals that have some stake in, in, in the Middle East. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to see among the participants a lot of diplomats and ambassadors, some of them I, I, I already know, the international community have been helpless in, in, uh, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. They will do nothing. I'm sure that if tomorrow Israel bombs one Palestinian city with an atomic bomb, not Europe, not anybody in the world will say something. They will ignore it. Now look what's happening now, today, today, 2.3 million Palestinians in Gaza are without water, without electricity, complete siege. They don't receive food even, and nobody cares. Just 10 kilometers away from Erez, in, 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 in the beaches of uh, uh, Ashdod or Ashkelon or, or Batya, the Israeli society is enjoying life, a very nice life. And, and that's why the Palestinians are very sensitive to time. If you want two-state solutions, okay, thank you, bring it now. I, I cannot wait another 70 years of negotiations to try to see who's uh, from the Israelis accept or does not accept. Now, the, the, the American administration was recently talking to leaders of settlements, to regional councils, trying to convince them to their plan. And nobody was talking to the Palestinians. And this is really the, the, the main problem. Uh, the whole international community is also enjoying seeing, or very comfortable seeing, the Palestinians oppress, oppressing the, their own people. We don't have democracy. We have a very non-democratic system in Gaza and the West Bank, and nobody cares. So for us, we, we need to see something that will make more results in a shorter period of time. And we, we believe that a, a movement that starts in Palestine and has an echo all over the world, calling for equal rights is the best way we have. It has a moral power that can gap the, the difference in, 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 in power between us and the Israelis. Uh, uh, but generally speaking, you know, the confederation options was not very successful all over the world. The federation options are more uh, successful, whether in Irish or, or in, in Ireland or Belgium. Or so we, we need to study this. We need to put an experts that can work these things. 
But I can tell you that the new generation, the present and the future generation of Palestinians are coming with a lot of good faith to be good citizens in this state. This language talks to us. It will have a good chemistry. We need to see how we can a little bit decrease the fears on the Israeli sides and try to have a good chemistry on the Israeli sides for, for, for this option. And here we need to be very wise in uh, picking up a good message that will have a good reaction from the Israeli society and also from the international community. Ilad. Uh, I personally see the uh, confederation and federation ideas as good ideas. Uh, I spent dozens of hours uh, of discussions um, and, and presentations in recent years uh, with the protagonists of, um, of these ideas. Uh, but, and there is a but here, it's for a later stage. It's not, uh, it's not going to serve as a bypass um, uh, of the negotiations on the core issues, the core contentious issues between Israelis and Palestinians. You need a border. You need a uh, even if it's a border within a federation, you need a um, you need to discuss Jerusalem. You need to discuss refugees. You need to discuss security arrangements, etc. Afterwards, once you've um, you've come to terms with the uh, with um, these four issues, then you can start thinking about a larger um, a larger outlook on uh, on either. A confederation, a, an Israeli-Palestinian one, an Israeli-Palestinian Jordanian one, whatever. These ideas are good, but they cannot serve as the first stage of um, of, um, of, a, of any kind of an agreement between uh, Israelis and Palestinians. But I would like to very briefly uh, refer or, or relate to uh, to what uh, uh, Peter said um, in, in in his uh, in his last um, intervention. Um, the uh, I don't want to control any uh, any any Palestinian. I don't want to control millions of Palestinians, um, and that's exactly what will happen if we are going down to a one-state uh, situation. I, I, I want the Palestinians to have rights. I want the Palestinians to have sovereignty, uh, and and I think that uh, that uh, the one-state will provide immorality rather than uh, morality. Because uh, because Israelis will never um, accept, and this is this is very um, it is sad to say, but uh, they will never accept uh, that the majority uh, within Israel, um, uh, within encompassed within the Israeli boundaries, uh, will be non uh, non Jewish. And um, and this is what will happen. I don't think they will get equal rights. When you hear, when you hear people from the right in Israel uh, stating that uh, yes, of course, the Palestinians will have equal rights and uh, they will be able to to move uh, to and from everywhere, uh, etc. They will be exactly like Israelis, except for one little thing: voting. Okay. So, uh, so immorality lies there and not in the two-state uh, solution. Two-state solution provides the end of conflict, the finality to all claims, and the end of occupation. This will not happen in a one-state situation. Thank you, Gilad. I think uh, Fania also raised her hand uh, with regard to this issue. Thank you, Fania. Thank you. Yes, this was... Uh... This has grown into a very fascinating webinar. Um, I agree with uh, Gilad, this is no surprise to you. Um, there's also a generational element here. Um, I don't know if I'm the oldest participant and I'm not going to uh, compete, uh, but I still remember very, very clearly the 1970s. I think that the year that Peter was born was the year that I already sat on the a floor in the corner of the kibbutz, a room and a half, listening to political meetings. Uh, Palestinians came, Egyptians came, uh, later people from the Israeli right wing and the settlements. A uh, Peace Now movement came to get my father's blessing and it was unofficially launched on our bare floor in the kibbutz room. 
you know, we, we have been, and maybe I'm saying this as a self critique, uh, on a moral high ground for many years, possibly misunderstanding a lot, but the uh, Zionist liberal left two statists, that part of the peace camp, always felt and, and strive to be, to be honest, on a moral high ground. Um, which is why it is so familiar to me now that I'm old and wise and uh, slightly world weary, it is familiar to me to hear Peter coming with, you know, with your moral high ground, you know, this will be equality, this will be justice, no peace without justice, Palestinians and Jews will be equal in the future, Israel, Palestine. This is very much the moral high ground that we prided in when we thought about two states, democracies, living in peace, economically fruitful, and so on. This is not going to happen, unfortunately, in the coming decades. Possibly not the two-state ideal, certainly not the one-state ideal. We have not yet, none of those commenting second round so far have referred to our co-panelist Asaf Malach. And Asaf, you know, I, I listened to your words very, very carefully, somewhere familiar, somewhere perhaps from a more recent uh, in intellectualization of, of, of your political position. Um, we need to engage very respectfully with what Asaf has said. And I disagree with almost everything you said, Asaf, and also with a few of the uh, um, pre-assumptions. We need to take it very carefully and to listen with great respect to a position which is shared by in different variations and I think less methodically, less analytically and so on, by a good 60 plus percent of Israeli, the Israeli population, including some of those in the, many of those in the center and some of those in the center left. There are two main fallacies, I think, in, in, in Peter's um, very beautiful vision. The fallacy of application and the fallacy of trust. We've talked about applicability, the question of how to get from here to there, which I should not repeat it now, the question of trust. I do not trust, even I, and certainly the 90 something Israelis who are on the right of me, percent of Israelis who are on the right of me on this scale. I do not trust enough, neither the Palestinian leadership, and I know that Summer does not speak for the Palestinian leadership, nor my own leadership, the Jewish Israeli current political elite, enough to make a jump, a salto mortale, <clears throat> into a one <clears throat> state or confederation initiative. I would if a million Palestinians followed summer. I would if summer were the voice of civil society in Palestine. But then I would still, still have to deal with a huge part of Israeli Jewish civil society who is standing behind, behind Asaf Malach. No national rights to Palestinians, full stop and all sorts of solutions around it. I will not be the one or my children to, to jump into the abyss between Summer's hope, Asaf's hope, and Peter's dream. It's far too dangerous, far too dangerous. Sorry not to be the bearer of good news again. Thank you, um, uh, Vanya. And um, I think that uh, if, if I, I, I may, I want to add a follow up to you, um, which is, I think, um, really uh, where I personally strongly agree with uh, Peter. I, I, don't, I don't see myself as a strong, having a strong preference between these two very far away models. Each of one can be held and each of them can be wonderful. It all, all depends on how they're implemented. This is my view. But it is also very clear to me that um, talking about two states at, in, at this political juncture without addressing head on the issue of 
Palestinian basic fundamental rights of political participation is a way of disguising um, a strategy to defer endlessly uh, any kind of solution. And this is why I chose um, the particular quote um, making this argument from Peter's essay in my introductory remarks. So for you, um, listening to you, I really am quite, um, I, I'm in agreement with many of your points, but I'm a little bit in, uh, disturbed by this um, seeming willing, willingness to continue to live in a condition in which even Asaf Malach admits there is a very enormous problem of uh, what um, is what are the rights of the persons li living under Israeli control. So don't we agree about it, <laughs> Itamar? I mean, you are also continuing to live. It is unbearable, and we are trying to find a way out. We are arguing about the way out, all of us. Yes, of course. Um, Asaf, uh, since your words have been referred to um, at this point by Fania, maybe you, you would like to respond. Asaf, just no. I would like to ask Peter, for me, it's a kind of uh, amazing thing that your recommendation is to have a pressure on Israel because of that situation in your point of view, you know, you also recommend to uh, uh, the US to pressure the Kingdom of Jordan to dismantle their structure of regime. You also uh, recommend because uh, 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 reasons of justice to, uh, uh, to the US to, uh, uh, have a pressure on China, on uh, Syria, on all over the, the, the uh, uh, undemocratic regimes, only for reasons of uh, justice. And you know, we have many, many advantages over all these regimes. Now you can't uh, disagree with me, okay, we have a, a disagreement about uh, how to see the whole picture. But there are other side, there is a problem. Very, the Palestinian, the Arab refusal to uh, 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 receive all the uh, uh, petition uh, uh, suggestions is so clear. And the, the, uh, the results of the uh, Oslo Accords and so on, it's so clear. So only we are the evil of the world. It's uh, to exaggerate even according to your line of thought. This is a, a, a question or a comment. But, uh, uh, but especially I would like to, to relate to another point, which is uh, uh, for me, as a, not only as a, uh, as a citizen, but also as a scholar, uh, it, it, for me, it's interesting also to read the, uh, Peter's piece and to relate to the differences between us as a, how to interpret it in the, nowadays the Jewish identity and its connection with politics. Because when I, for me, uh, Zionism is not about uh, 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 only security or place, uh, uh, secure, uh, secure place for Jews. Uh, it's not only about that. It's about create a political sphere, a public sphere in which the Jews will uh, 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 will have the chance to implement their traditions and their values and their point of view. As uh, so, so, and and maybe you know you mentioned yourself in different places as a follower of Hadam in this uh, direction. But the the traditional division between the uh, political Zionism and cultural Zionism is in a way confused because Herzl support Jewish state or, 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 or state for the Jews, but he didn't uh, uh, think that it should have a Jewish character in its laws and its kinds of regime. 
אבסולוט איקוואליטי בין כל הסיטיזנס. ואחד העם, who criticize Herzl for his uh, natural state, uh, uh, recommended to, to start with a, a Merkaz Ruhani or a, a, a cultural center, but this is, will be the right way to, uh, 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 to establish a, what he called a real Jewish state. And Aviner in his uh, a short book about uh, a Zionist uh, thinkers called the, the chapter on Hadaham from the Jews, uh, from the uh, state for the Jews to a Jewish state. This is the name of the chapter about Hadaham, which means that uh, I think that this is close to, uh, this is not the, the, the place to, to uh, enlarge this point, but this is uh, my point of view, which is a republic, national republicanism. And I think that really Hadaham was close to that and not only Uh, uh, so about uh, 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 autonomy without sovereignty. And uh, I think this is a very interesting uh, difference between different kinds of uh, 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 Jewish identity in those days. And the result, the result of experience of 70 years of uh, uh, the American or North America, American Jews and the Israeli Jews. Thank you, Asaf. Um, uh, Peter, I want to give you um, the last word, uh, but we have uh, Nathaniel, Nathaniel Behrman with us as well, who requested uh, to speak and uh, has raised his hand, and so he has been upgraded to a panelist. Uh, Nathaniel is a professor um, of law and, intellect, uh, in, and I believe also religion at Brown University. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh Thank you, Itamar, and thank you for the, this amazing panel. Um, I, I want to just make a really a short question, hopefully, to uh, Gilad and Pani, um, basically to the two, the two staters among us. Um, I, very briefly, I grew up as a, a religious Zionist in the United States. Um, I've, I've supported two states since the early 70s when I first, uh, when I, when the, when I first began discussing such things. Um, So I'm an old two-stater, um, but this is the, the challenge that Peter is placing before us, Peter and others like him. It is very simple, and I, and I feel that it's not being addressed head on. When Gilad says, if we go down the one-state road, it will be this and this. Or when Pani says, if we go one state, I don't want to go one state because it will be this and this. The challenge that Peter and others are putting before us is there is one state right now. There has been one state for 53 years. And as far as we can tell, barring a miracle or a catastrophe, there will be one state between the river and the sea for the rest, at least, of my natural life. That's the challenge they're putting before us. There is, as far as I can tell in my reading of Israeli Jewish politics, No constituency except for merits, and even there, there is no constituency for uh, the establishment of a real Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza. It just, there is no such constituency, again, except in merits, maybe. Right? Um, the exclusion of Palestinian Israelis from political power made very, very clear in this last round of elections. It's, it's, very, it's crystal clear let alone the establishment of the Palestinian state. The, the challenge for you, Gilad and Honey, is this. Why are you talking about one state as though it's something that can be chosen in the future? It is here. It has been here for more than a half a century. And as far as we can tell, it will be here for the rest of our lives. What, with my understanding of Peter's challenge, I don't want to speak for him, but my understanding of this kind of challenge is one state is here. What kind of one state is it going to be? Or Actually, first of all, what kind of state is it now? How would you describe it in political science terms? Um, and we know Michael Spard has now taken a position about the, West, the regime in the West Bank that's fitting the definition of, of apartheid under international law. What kind of one state is it now? And what kind of one state should it be in the future? That's the question that Peter and others are saying we should face, not should we choose one state, One state is here. It's the one state reality, the one state condition, not a solution or a choice or an option or anything of that nature. 
that's the challenge, and I feel that that's not being faced head on. Thank you. Okay, and uh, a short intervention from Amnon Reichmann, and then back to you, Peter. Okay, very briefly, this is indeed has been fascinating. I just want to throw in a methodological point here, and it seems that, the, the, that we oscillate between the ease and the ought. And I, and I think, and I think uh, we've just heard about that. What, what is the ease now on the ground? Uh, what is feasible in terms of a programmatic thought? And what is the ought in terms of what would be just um, to the extent that some conditions are met? And I haven't, I'm not sure that I understand at the end of our webinar, which is an invitation maybe to a subsequent uh, to a follow up. Why do we need, what do we need states for? And what is the relationship between states and nations to the, and I actually d disagree with the stuff. I think Palestinians are a nation now and Jews are a nation now. There've been debates about that, but putting this aside, what do we expect as a matter of theory rather than only as a matter of pragmatics? And, and if we nail this down, I think we can make some progress. Thank you. Thanks, Amnon. Uh, Peter, the floor is yours for um, last uh, words here. So just very quickly uh, uh, to, uh, to Asaf's point, I, I, I would just note that um, the United States gives Israel $3 billion a year. Um, we don't give China any money. In fact, we've now imposed sanctions of various kinds on China. With Syria, we have we have not only imposed sanctions, but we've supported rebel groups to try to overthrow the government. Um, so I, in terms of Jordan, I wouldn't necessarily support any money going to the Kingdom of Jordan, except maybe some humanitarian money to help with the refugee problem in, from Iraq and stuff that we helped to create for them. But so I don't think I'm holding Israel to a double standard. I'm saying I don't want as an American, my tax dollars to go to commit human rights in any abuses in any places. And, and uh, I have stood in Palestinian homes that are slated in villages that are slated for dem demolition. And I don't want those bulldozers to be paid for by with American money. And in fact, I want, I want the United, so America has skin in the game here. And I want America to use its leverage to try to support the idea of basic human rights. Um, I, I think that um, I have not heard, and maybe I'm not, have not been, you know, been listening carefully enough, but I, I have not heard from folks who still believe the two-state decision is possible, um, a pathway by which we could get there. Now they might, um, uh, and in fact, that's why I raised the challenge of, of, of them at least being willing to engage with the idea of serious international pressure. Because again, the notion that the, that the, the Israelis on their own in a comfortable status quo are gonna choose an alternative, um, it seems to me to become less, less and less imaginable. Um, the, now they might respond to me that I have not offered a clear path for change and that's possible too. But again, I, I, I think ultimately, if there is a mass movement for in the name of equality that we have seen in the 20th century, that mass movements with in the name of that speak in the name of equality can make things that seem impossible become possible. And, the, and I would just, the last point I would just make is we, I think, are still, because Jews have power, we assume we can simply assert certain things without having to debate their justice. So for, I just want to, and I want to just just end with this on the question of refugees, because I think it's important for us to face this question as we simply assume that we can take the question of Palestinian refugees off the table, because that's how the only kind of two-state solution that most, I think, Israeli and diaspora Jews can imagine. By what right do we, a people who dreamed of return for 2,000 years to this territory, tell Palestinians who were expelled in 1948 or their children or grandchildren that they do not have the right to return, right? We can say as a matter of power that we may think we have the power to, to quash that conversation. But I think we have to actually also address it as Jews at the level of justice. Um, and I think that that is also seems to me been, uh, if you don't address that question, then I think even if you could get to a two-state solution, I think the danger is that a two-state solution without a just response to the refugee question is merely a ceasefire. Thank you, Peter. Um, I think this was a challenging conversation. I think that we had um, really um, many different voices around the table, which is something that I feel is ex extraordinarily important. I um, appreciate your willingness to engage with what is ultimately also an internal, kind of internal Israeli-Palestinian conversation in this kind of very direct level. I heard you uh, calling for a certain kind of movement here, um, which I think is a brave 
uh, stance to take from um, far away. And um, I really want to uh, give special thanks to each and every panelist who um, I learned a lot from. I learned a lot from all of you. Thanks for being with us, everyone. Um, and we hope to see you in other events at the Minerva Center for the Rule of Law and Extreme Conditions. Goodbye for now.